Okay, welcome everyone to the Cube in uh, Orlando, Florida. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, SiliconAngle.tv. We are at SAP Sapphire for the third year in a row. We're coming up on our two-year anniversary of, of the thing called the Cube, uh, which has been our flagship telecast for uh, going to the top tech events, extracting the signal from the noise. Um, dozens and dozens of events we've done over the past two years. Um, over 600 people we've interviewed. Um, petabytes of content. I think Mark Hopkins says we could run eight weeks straight if we just hit the play button on reruns. So we're excited. We're here in Orlando, Florida. Where SAP 2012 is going to announce uh, Sapphire 2012. Going to announce a lot of new announcements around HANA, Sybase um, in the keynote tonight. So I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com. I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. And, John, it's going to be back here at uh, Sapphire. This is our third year at this event. And uh, and uh, really was was one of the second event we did together. And really kicked off the the cube's uh, amazing growth. Well, the thing, Dave, that's happened is is that we came to the first SAP two years ago with um, our first kind of rev of what we thought would be very cool, quality, independent programming. And I want to say to everyone out there watching, we're going to bring you wall to wall coverage of SAP Sapphire 2012. Um, the CEOs are going to come on board, all the senior executives, people from VMware, EMC, SAP, their customers thought leaders, bloggers. We're going to have wall-to-wall coverage starting today, eight hours, ten hours tomorrow, and then Thursday. Uh, I mean, Wednesday, we're going to wrap it up in the evening. And we would not be able to bring this great independent program if it was not for the support of and the underwriting of support of SAP and EMC. Those two companies have been great at supporting our mission of the Cube, which is to bring you uh, in-depth, independent coverage of these tech events. Dave and, and SAP and, SA and EMC Great support for us to have from them, financial support, and letting us do our independent commentary. You know, John, um, and you mentioned those two companies. It's, it, the first Cube gig we ever did together was EMC World, and it was, it was a good show, uh, but totally different crowds, isn't it? I mean, what a stark contrast. You know, EMC World is, you know, a lot of infrastructure people. SAP, it's all about business. Everybody here is in suits. You know, the, the attire is business, right? I mean, <laughs> usually they say attire, business, casual. Well, it says uh, here, attire, business. They want you in a suit. And uh, so I know it's hard for you from the West Coast coming in, you know, tie. But well, I mean, it's the West Coast. <laughs> I got, you know, I didn't have to wear a jacket the next to the first night. But SAP is a big player there. It's about business, yeah. too. And you're right. But the, the, the thing is, what's going on around them is the world is changing. And big data, here yeah, we've been covering for many years now, uh, and storage and clouds all coming together with mobile and social. And it's just really a phenomenon. It's really changing the big established players like SAP, certainly changing the businesses, whether it's financial, healthcare, or, or um, large enterprise, to new hyperscale companies. And the fact of the matter is, is that this week is Sapphire 2012, but it's also the week that uh, Facebook is going public. And Facebook IPO is a watershed moment in the industry. It's going to happen on the 18th this week. Um, I'm expecting the shares to go crazy. I'm in Palo Alto. I'm hearing fireworks on, on last Friday going off because their roadshow ended. Word has it they're going to um, close out their shares a day early, two days early. <laughs> Those uh, are the accidental billionaires shooting off fireworks? Is that the deal? People on my street are going, <laughs> like, oh, yeah, the house is going to double in value. The bottom line, Facebook's IPO is a testament to the fact that our world has changed. I call it the Netscape moment. Uh, mm. No one in the mainstream press is writing about this. So I'm, I'm talking about it for the first time. It's, it's the Netscape moment. Net, what Netscape did with their IPO set in motion a historic bubble called the dot-com bubble, and that was the beginning. And Facebook right now will have that moment. Yeah, I think you're right, John. Maybe, many people may not remember. It was 1993, 94 time frame, and Netscape, you, were, you I don't know if you are out there at the time, but no, I was on the East Coast. shortly thereafter you moved out there and, I know real estate prices went through the roof, and it was like the first of the big bubble waves post, you know, the 1980s. It was the internet. It was, it was the inflection point for the internet. And I think yeah. what Facebook's doing is an inflection point for a new architecture where the user experiences are different, and that's driving things like SAP Sapphire. So, although Sapphire 2012 is not as sexy as say in a Facebook IPO, but it's very relevant because businesses are running their architectures on, on SAP. And the fact of the matter is. Cloud, mobile, and social, our editorial at Silicon Angle Wikibon, is changing the value chains of, of businesses. And big data and mobility and social are at the heart of this disruption. And it's going to be an entirely new industry. Yeah, so, you know, we've talked about this on theCUBE before. You mentioned Netscape. Um, we've also talked about Google's IPO, which happened, you know, post-bubble. 
and and sustained obviously a lot of tech innovation. I, I think Facebook could even be bigger. What do, what are your thoughts on that? Bigger in terms of the IPO? Yeah. Uh, I think that, yes, they already are bigger. Yeah, in, in, in terms of the after effect, the aftershocks of the, of the IPO, because Google, as you remember, it was in, in an environment from, from an IT standpoint that was not very exciting. It was post-bubble. Everybody was kind of down a little bit. And, and, you know, obviously Google provided some momentum, some significant momentum. Right now, Facebook's IPO is going into a bubble, and I think it could be more well, Netscape-like than perhaps the Google IPO. Yeah, well, that's that's a good point. I mean, I think you could look at two analogs. You say, on one hand, it's Netscape-like, where it's euphoric and relevant. Obviously, the browser, but the browser didn't last long. IE came over with their with their power and took over that business. On Google, on the other hand, post bubble had a real sustainable operating business mm. and created billions and billions of dollars in revenue through their pay per click advertising, which was actually a bona fide business model. Facebook does not have that um, Google effect. They just have a massive footprint of users, but they don't have that magical um, business model established. So you're hearing the Facebook executives say, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll figure out the business model. And, you know, there's a, there's a kink in the armor around the fact that it could come quick and go quick and that they could lose just as fast as Netscape did. So, obviously, we talked about that on the Cube with their um, buy of Instagram for a billion dollars was absolutely a defensive move to make sure they don't lose mobile. And, uh, you know, Facebook is weak in mobile. It's not just us talking about it. Industry pundits are, and experts are coming out of the woodwork saying that, you know, mobility is weak for Facebook, and that's a threat, and there's no ad model yet. So those two things right there make Facebook a, a risky proposition long term. But I think the IPO is going to pop like crazy. I think it's going to be a uh, you know, huge wealth creator. I think it's going to go up. Uh, it's going to go through the roof. And, and these trends that you're talking about in social uh, have ripple effects into the enterprise. We've talked many times in the Cube about the consumerization of, of IT. A lot of IT organizations, I would estimate, are anywhere between five and ten years behind, you know, the large internet giants, and maybe even further. Maybe they'll never get there. It's it's hard for IT. They they're supporting many hundreds, sometimes thousands of applications. Whereas guys like Google come in with a clean sheet of paper and can build a highly homogeneous infrastructure and start from scratch. And and so CEOs and business executives go home on the weekend and go, hey. How come my Facebook and my Gmail is so easy, but my IT at work is just so hard? What's the deal? And so that's put a lot of pressure on org IT organizations, and it's rippling through to companies like SAP, who are you know, known for their complexity, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think you know we talk about this on our new publication, DevOps, where you know there's a developer focus right now in the business of cloud and mobile. Um, I think you're going to hear from SAP a huge. Uh, discussion around mobility, app mobility. You heard a couple announcements out there um, today about apps. Those announcements are quite frankly boring in my opinion. But I think that's just a boring, nice business model for SAP where they want to create this app store environment. You're seeing these, those, the app store out there. And I think the fundamental thing that you're seeing from SAP is, um, Dave, relative to the Facebook and these trends is they have a couple things going on. From their core infrastructure, they got the database focus. You know, they said they want to be the number two database by 2015. They got HANA. They got some integration points around big data. But if you look at some of the things they're doing from the uh, in the ecosystem around startups, they still have SAP Ventures, which we're going to have uh, Nico uh, Markovic on uh, to talk about some of the things they're doing with SAP Ventures. So they're investing heavily. And they also have a new group that Vishal Sikha started up. Um, it's a startup incubation program in Palo Alto. And they are absolutely putting out the, I call the, entrepreneurial manure out there on the fields because they want apps to pop out out of nowhere. And I think this is the DevOps angle where these rapid programming environments need a back-end infrastructure. So you see SAP absolutely betting on mobile, They're betting on the mobile ecosystem for the enterprise. They think that consumerization of IT is going to happen. I think that's a really good astute uh, comment. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, I mean, SAP competes in the $250 billion software market, the enterprise software market, and they're a $14 billion company. They've got about a $75 billion market cap, so they traded about five times their revenue. Um, not bad for a $14 billion, you know, $13, $14 billion company that's growing at, you know, 10 to 15% to the high end of that range a year. Um, at the same time, they're going through a transformation. They've got cash in the bank, five to six billion dollars in the bank. They've made some moves that we'll talk about with uh, recently with success factors, but they've had to go through a transformation. SAP is uh, known for its complexity. I mean, to roll out, John, uh, SAP supply chain to 100 countries and you know do the whole financial suite 
probably cost an organization three to four hundred million dollars. I mean, it's big bucks, a lot of services involved. We talk a lot in the Cube about services angles. Services angle. That's why you see companies like Accenture here and Deloitte and CSC because it's a gold mine for them. So a lot of complexity. It's also why you see SAP, you know, partnering up with people like VMware and others trying to simplify, you know, their complex infrastructure. So that's sort of the backdrop here. And SAP's had to make some moves. They bought Sybase, you know, to get into mobility and to get into database. Uh, they bought uh, uh, business objects to get to compete in the BI space. They recently b bought success factors that. You know, we talked about off camera. I think you told me it was 3.4 billion. Uh, yeah, yeah I thought it was. Yeah, I thought it was higher, but no, you're right. It's 3.4 billion. So making some moves into mobility, you know, getting into the cloud. Um, but their core business is really still supply chain. You know, that's they're doing a lot of maintenance on supply well, chain. Well, competition out there, workday. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. The success factors uh, acquisition, 3.4 billion. The people that I know that that talk to me about the application space say that was a was a rich price to pay. But I've said, hey paying up for uh, companies that are there is better than R&D because R&D is very risky. But what I'm told is that that uh, specifically success factors are very narrow around talent management. So think about the old PeopleSoft you know, software. It's the core HR. Now, SAP has core HR too, but it's big and it's old. It's not cloud. It's not self-service. All that stuff they get from success factors, but it's very narrow around... Uh, talent acquisition or talent management. You know, so you want to keep your best people, right? You want to incent them. You see, you know, people leaving on mass at companies like you know Oracle, for example, or even even HP to a certain extent. So you want to retain that talent. Well, that's what Success Factors is all about. But they've got an integration challenge here, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens. You mentioned Workday. Workday is like PeopleSoft plus. Success factors rolled into one, so it's going to be interesting to see. And they're doing a, uh, you know, you know their CEO. I know Dave Duffield, but you know, uh, uh, Bushri. The board of Cloudera. They're going to, okay, right. So they're going to do an IPO later on this year. So that's going to be really interesting to see how they compete. You know, where does it doing very well? So, but SAP making some moves. Um, we had uh, uh, Hagaman Schnabe on last year. You had interview with McDermott a couple years ago. So these are some of the things that we're going to be asking them about. You know, what's the strategy? What's the plan? Yeah, and I think we're watching too. Like uh, just some of my notes here to watch from last year, Dave, is that you know success factors want to drill down on uh, that deal. Mm. A lot of people questioning the success of that uh, deal. I think it's a good, not a bad deal. Just like Sidebase was, was a good deal. I think yeah. it's a good deal. Um, they said they want to be number two in the database market by 2015. Uh, well, let's see how they go you know on that what, one. You know what Ellison's line on that is? He goes, "That's like me playing against Kobe." <laughs> 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 Um, we'll see, I'll but see, but I think in fairness to SAP, they they got a different angle, and that angle is mobility. As yeah, you know. mobility and just a different yeah. de redefining data. And we know from our coverage, uh, the data data market is hot. Um, but HANA, HANA uh, adoption, I want to see literally the meat and the bone on that one. Um, big data strategy, obviously. Uh, Jeff Kelly and I have been in Palo Alto multiple times, meeting with their top brass on what the big data strategy is, and clearly it's side base IQ and HANA in the real-time analytics space and some other complex event processing kind of stuff. Um, and then I'm interested in, in watching the SAP Ventures uh, moves. They've been very quiet, um, but now we're going to start to see their strategy relative to the applications because at the end of the day, if they can enable development within the consumerization of IT trend line inside the companies, that's a winning strategy. And that's a game changer for Bill McDermott, in my opinion, uh, to use his word. And uh, you know, I think that's interesting. I'm watching that, and I think no one's really picking up on that, Dave. Here, and I talked to everyone right here. What developer angle? I think you're seeing them telegraph their play, and that is SAP Ventures in this new startup focus. They said, "Hey, we want to fill the app store because if they don't fill, if they don't have an app store, they're dead." Yeah, I think you know, John. So you mentioned Hana. I mean, I would throw in cloud, you know, slash SaaS and mobility. I mean, those are the technical angles of of SAP and. Frankly, SAP customers are starved for cool technology. You know, you know, let's face it. I mean, there's not not been a lot of it in the last you know decade, and so they've had to go out and uh, acquire some of these companies, and they've done a good job of that. And so that's, I think, one reason why Hana is so exciting to the customers that you talk to here because it's it's cool tech and it's going to be game changing in terms of application performance. So I'm also very interested in learning about that uptake. Last year was we didn't hear much about big data from SAP. You coined the term fast data, uh, and then subsequently, when after Jeff Kelly put out the report on big data, you know we heard a lot from SAP on big data. Hey, we're big data too. But you had 
uh, uh, coined the term big fast data. And I think that's really what SAP is all about. I mean, about. I just talked to one of their customers here, and, and, and he's saying, hey, we're not in the peta petabyte scale. But they still have terabytes, and they're moving a lot of it around in, in real time. And it's a challenge for them. So that's fast data. It's not necessarily the biggest data, but they're doing things differently. They're moving it in and out of, of memory and cache. And sometimes the cache layer is a little bit too small for the amount of data they're moving around. So you know, as David Floyer is pointing out in his work on wikibon.org, a new architecture is developing, and we're covering it. And it's really about storage meets database slash processor. So very cutting edge time. Absolute, no doubt in my mind, a redefinition of, of tech inside the enterprise because it's already happening within cloud. So, totally see the consumerization of IT in play here. But it's not what everyone thinks of this day. It's different, different kind of formula. So we're going to watch that. Well, I think too, John, to your point uh, about you know the size of, of the data and, and size is only one attribute of, of big data. Uh, there are other, other attributes, but to that point. A lot of the projects like Hadoop are off to the side, as you well know. You know, they're sort of back office or back room or experimental. I think that what you're going to see over the next couple of years is that that big data play, those devices, those machines that are generating all this big data are going to be direct feeds into the operational data of the company. And, and technologies like HANA and in-memory technology is going to be able to absorb the key nuggets and be able to process that information. I think you're going to see an integration of that big data and those operational systems. And that bodes well for SAP. And whether it's you know big, kind of big, or super big, you know there's money to be made there. Well, we're here in Orlando, folks. We are the Cube SiliconAngle.tv's coverage of SAP Sapphire 2012. We this is just the beginning. We just our kickoff. John and Dave setting the table for what's to come, which is a slew of announcements, slew of PR, slew of rah rah, uh, clapping on these, all the new customer wins. We will we will vet the signal from the noise uh, and share that with you here on the Cube. We're going to have a lot of great guests. We're going to go to parties. We're going to get deep uh, within SAP. And like usual, we're going we're to bring some great guests and knowledge to you. Um, our independent coverage here from SiliconANGLE Wikibon would not be possible without the generous support of SAP and EMC. Those two companies have been absolute great supporters of social media, social knowledge, and it's things like Facebook's IPO that makes it possible for this new generation of, of social technology. I want to thank SAP and, uh, and EMC for that support. Dave, Orlando, that's where the action is, but outside the, in the press, the Facebook IPO is coming this week, but also the scandal of Yahoo has been rocking the tech world, and, and uh, if you've been online in the past week, you can't have not missed the fact that the Yahoo CEO, Scott Thompson, was uh, marred in a botched, gorked I, uh, bio, and he lied in his resume, he said he had a CS degree. And for the folks out there, I actually have a CS degree, so, and I can prove it, but. Uh, Is it on your resume? It's, it's on my <laughs> resume, actually. I actually went back to make sure it was actually accurate. Um, but the CEO of Yahoo, in case you missed it, basically lied on his resume, lied on his bio for over a decade. Uh, president of PayPal, became the CEO of Yahoo, and he got caught by the activist uh, shareholder of Yahoo, who's in a proxy fight with Yahoo. The CEO of Yahoo resigned today, or stepped down, or was fired. Reports from Karis Kushner on All Things D, Dave, saying that um, he was um, terminated with cause, which means he gets no severance. Um, now there's reports in the Wall Street Journal that he notified the board that he had cancer. So obviously he's jockeying for a settlement. Um, and to add another weird twist to this whole saga is that last week he said publicly that it was a mistake and he blamed it on a recruiting firm, High, um, High Angles and Struggles, whatever it's called, and they produced the resume where he actually lied on his resume. So he's gone. So, I mean, what do you take of this? Uh, I just, you know, you lie it's, on your it's, you know, why would you, right? And it's hard. To, it, you know, I can kind of understand a busy executive, maybe some, you know, overzealous underlings start to dress things up. But I... You know, I think executives, it's their responsibility to look at their resume, you know, look at your LinkedIn profile, people. I mean, come on. I mean, it's your brand. It's resume. your personal brand, right? He I mean, lied so. in his resume. Yeah, that's, I think... Um, 1979, computer science degree. He didn't have a computer science degree. Well, I mean, I just, I, I don't, it's going to, people are going to find out. Here's I mean, it's just not I, worth here, here, it. First of all, I think this, like, hydrous and struggles, these firms, but forget the guy that lied in his resume. He, they produce the smoking gun, which means you can't trust them. So not, I'm not saying advocate lying for the sake of trusting a third party, but the, the firm to defend themselves threw them under the bus. So, you know, I just, I just think recruiting is just another area that big data it will disrupt. Uh, it's a dying business, and uh, that was one weird thing that jumped out. I mean, 
But I actually like the guy, and we know people that know him, yep. and uh, he's a good guy. It's just, I don't know what he's thinking. It's just one of those yeah, it's just a mistake. You know, it's just going to cost him his, you know, a little bit of his reputation and, and obviously a nice big severance. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, um, and we're going to be right back. We're here in Orlando. Dave Vellante here is here with John Furrier. That's me. We're Sapphire 2012. We'll be right back. The Cube is this conceptual box, if you will, and we bring people inside of the Cube and then we share ideas, but those ideas don't stay inside the Cube. We explode that idea. We allow that idea to grow and grow, and it does. So we really try to own the whole enterprise technology space. I mean, that's what we're all about. We take analysis, we take publishing, we take news, and we take live TV, and we combine it together in a product and share that with our community. No one's doing what we're doing. Uh, what we're doing, in my opinion, is the future of media, future of television, future of the internet. Video is an amazing, powerful product. So we work in what John and I talk about as a data model. People always say to us, well, how do you guys make money? We sell knowledge, we sell information, we sell data. So the problem that we, are, that we identified is about what we call big, fast, total data. Anybody can analyze a gigabyte of data. If you do a thousand gigabytes, that's a terabyte of data. You take a thousand terabytes, that's a petabyte of data. A thousand petabytes, that's a zettabyte of data. So you are talking big data, lots and lots of data, and can you analyze it in real time as it comes in, right? The Cube is like we call ESPN of tech because we want to cover technology like ESPN covers sports. John has a great vision for what's going to happen next in tech. And so John is sort of that alter ego of mine that lets me see the future. We have a really amazing team of people that work with us. Michael Sean Wright, Mark Hopkins, you know, we've got Kim here today. We've got a team of people on our news desk uh, run by Kristen Nicole. So she has a team that help feed us the news of the day, what's happening, the analysis. We have a team of analysts, and they feed us information about what's happening. And then, really importantly, we have a community, a big community of, of many hundreds of contributors. We love technology, we love, we love the innovation, and that's what we do. We want to create a great user experience. And in order to do that properly, you've got to really, really prepare. The Cube for the past year that we've been in operation has been very, very successful. And uh, you know, companies do pay us to come here. I think the companies who bring us in with the Cube get two things. They get a third party independent resource to provide knowledge to their audience who are seeking it, this demand for the, for the product. And also complements their existing media. Uh, we're here at an event and uh, you know, the company has their own TV organization and they have to pay a premium for that. So we complement that by offering a objective, organic, third party, independent analysis of the event. That's why the top executives come in here. The Cube is a comfortable place. It's a place where people feel happy and are happy to share their knowledge with the world. And uh, we're happy to, to be ambassadors of, of that knowledge transfer. 
my entire career has been really built on relationships and talking to people and extracting knowledge from people, largely in a belly-to-belly -belly private forum. What theCUBE does is it explodes that to a huge audience. I mean, we've reached millions with theCUBE, and it's real time, it's live TV, so you've got to be quick on your feet, but you learn very fast, and then you iterate from that learning. So John and I play off of that, and we're constantly trying to up our game. Okay, we're back in Orlando. We are live in SAP Sapphire 2012. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com. I'm joined by my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org, and John, this is our day one of our third year here at Sapphire. It's all about business, it's about enterprise software, and it's about transformation and mobility and cloud and SaaS. It's a, it's a great conference. Yeah, I think one of the things about uh, SAP is, is that I've watched them transform over the years, and over the past four or five years, they went from kind of down and out, struggling on the downward slope to rebounding. And I think a lot of that has to do with one, market turnaround, but two, uh, Vishal Sikha invested heavily in, in SOA and, and back in the early web standards when you know web was in the bubble, he was really investing heavily and, and it paid off. And I think with the with their strategy coming together with, with the co-CEOs working out uh, well, you know, we've asked him many times, uh, we've gotten close to him, we've talked to him. It's, it's working, so I think SAP's got a little magic going on here. Um, you know, it's a classic big company. There, are, get the PR team sh shoving us a lot of stuff to, to look at and and uh, pedal to us, but for the most part, it looks good. I like what I'm seeing. I love the focus last year they had on mobile that paid out. What I want to see here this year is the proof. I want to see the mobile. I want to see the apps. I want to see real proof points. Yeah, I think you know if you uh, I think about what does SAP have to accomplish at this event? It's like you know, like the pregame, okay? What what has to happen for Team A or Team B to win? And to me, SAP's got to demonstrate to its customers that it can simplify uh, its deployments, its management, its infrastructure, and very importantly, that it can usher them into this new cloud, mobile, social, big data reality. And that's something that certainly their messaging has talked to the last several years, but they got to prove it, and I think that that's really what uh, what I'm looking and for. And the thing too is that we're living in an era of open source movement. Here we're talking about open source media for our cube, sharing knowledge, not charging for it, being underwritten for it. But but in the real action out there in this marketplace, open source programming, Hadoop, Apache, all these different opportunities out there where developers are getting free software, has created a massive boom. Now that is starting to affect these guys this year. Uh, and the big guys all over the place, not just SAP, everyone, including Oracle. So um, the role of open source is critical, and I think you know SAP plays the open card, Dave, and the open card is we're not Oracle, which is closed. That's the, you know, Oracle's the, you know, the evil empire, um, and SAP's playing the we're open ecosystem. So you can't play open and not have open source. So I want to see uh, what their solutions are relative to open source, and really specifically how Hana integrates into that, because if it does well with Cloudera's and, and the Hortonworks of the world, I think you're going to see great uptake, and the coexistence of unstructured and structured data will be a big part of that. Yeah, so um, so John, we got a big week here. We're here for three days. Uh, there's some news going on. Uh, it, we just You were talking about the, the Yahoo News and Scott Thompson. That's been covered, and he's been kicked around. On the valley, he's the Richard Nixon of the valley right now. He's <laughs> getting I am not pounded. A crook. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but uh, but there's some other news. You know, DevOps angle. It's got a it's got a story on uh, space ops. How NASA uses agile development to search for life on Mars. You know, DevOps is a trend that's that's really starting to take on. We just are doing in the process of doing a survey on uh, on Wikibon and in conjunction with Services Angle, John. 
And one of the questions we had was an adoption question around DevOps. Now, a huge percentage of the audience, about 50%, said DevOps is a new term to me. But surprisingly, about 20% said we're actually using, we're a DevOps shop, and we're actually achieving hyper productivity through DevOps. So I was encouraged by that. So we'll be producing those results uh, next week, uh, just a you know, first pass. Uh, we're going to try to get those out before our, our next gig, which is EMC World. And um, I think it's a real trend. I mean, I think this intersection between application development and, and infrastructure management, or as you've called it, ops dev, right? Because ops operations can't go down. Infrastructure can't go down. You know, if the test and dev, you know, doesn't work, okay, no big deal. But to really bring those two disciplines together, it's really a, an ops dev emphasis, isn't it? Yeah, it totally is. And I think the development paradigm is growing so fast. I mentioned open source. Um, but you have an operational requirement. So I think you're going to start to see a blend of both, a hybrid, ops dev, ops, uh, dev ops, ops dev. So this is really just a culture clash between essentially two disciplines. Um, you know, the legacy IT environment has always been siloed, hardcore network guys, hardware guys, and the software guys. So that's changing significantly with cloud. Um, you know, the software guys having more, more. Um, how do you say it? Uh, respect for the network guys and the, the their thinking around you know SLA and uptime. And I think you're going to see much more, you're seeing respect from the network guys and the hardware guys to the developers because of the rapid agile program environments out there, so with all these frameworks. So I think that is a natural collision course, and the companies that can deal with the cultural issues around the people will ultimately be the winner. That is a great point. I mean, we've covered converged infrastructure. Uh, we covered the you know the IBM integrated systems announcement. We were at this vSpecs launch. Um, there's clearly a trend toward converging hardware components, networking, storage, and, and servers, and that plays directly into the DevOps play. I think, but your, to your point, Organizationally, you know, networking guys report to different people than storage guys to, than to server guys, and those disciplines, and, and obviously the application people. Today, the application developers throw a piece of code over the fence, the operations people take it, they try to make it, you know, deploy it on their production infrastructure, they've got to hack away at it to make it work, and then they break something, then they go back to the applications development team, and they say, well, it was working fine when I gave it to you, you, know, you messed it up. And so this back and forth, back and forth puts a lot of pressure on people to meet their deadlines, meet their yeah, time and frame, think, and deliver product. And Dave, you know, this you made me think about uh, uh, something I've been thinking about that I haven't talked about, but I haven't talked about publicly yet, and that is, you know, we talk about cloud, mobile, and social, but with the with the advent of mobility so rapid right now on the growth scale, in-market mobility is the hottest thing. Cloud's kind of taking a back seat, so, you know, I really was kind of... Um, struck by the lack of emphasis Synergy was this year. I mean, Synergy was a total dud. I mean, it didn't really do anything. Like, I didn't, nothing came out of it. I mean, yeah, they had, but they had good themes. I mean, we've been to Synergy last year with the Cube there. Yeah, I mean, right. I think one of the reasons why Synergy was such a dud was the Cube wasn't there. <laughs> I mean, all kidding aside, um, it was the classic, you know, mobility, virtualization, the, the same themes. There's no real, I didn't feel anything other than the normal rah rah cloud virtualization, so that you know maybe it's too boring. Maybe they didn't they put good messaging around it, but mobility seems to be a center stage right now. So like, I think that is a lever in the marketplace that you're going to start to see people doubling down on. It's not so much cloud computing anymore. It's, it's much more of the market effects, the business benefits. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I I like Citrix. It was good, good to be there last year. We talked to some good customers. We got some good use cases, and but. There's sort of multiple companies in one. You know, they got the SaaS business, they got the desktop virtualization business, they got now, you know, the the the, the server virtualization piece. And mobility is obviously a big theme. But yeah, I think you're right. It, did it you was, like? I mean, did you like? Did you fall out of your chair saying, "Oh, synergy"? No, you know, I mean, we well, we 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 chose to do other other things, right? So I mean, no, I don't. I didn't fall out of my chair. I think that uh, it's good. But I think I think Citrix somehow needs to they need to, to pull it all together. You know? They have all the right elements. I mean, you know, yeah, definitely. Citrix Synergy is a lot like SAP in the sense that both have very active online communities. So if you look at SAP, I mean, to me, they're number one in the online social media space in terms of total community activation, real participation in terms of content development, collaboration. Citrix is right behind SAP. Citrix communities are very, very strong on our radar. We look at our CrowdSpots application we built. You know, they're there. I just, it's a vanilla message for the company. But it's all the right ones, right? It's cloud, it's virtualization, it's mobility, VDI. It's just, I don't see the oomph there. 
Well, I mean, it's just a marketing thing. I know. I think that, again, one of the things we're looking from SAP is really the proof points around, you know, the, the mobile enterprise, the app store for the enterprise. We heard a lot of talk about that. We actually had some demos. Remember, we had Oliver Busman on last year, and he talked about how they're implementing that internally. Um, other CIOs are, are talking about it. I want to see it now, all right? I want to talk to customers about how they're actually driving business from that. We saw some outliers. We saw some nice videos last year. Did you year. know that um, SAP Ventures is invested in violent memory? I think everybody's invested in violent yeah. memory. Things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Don Basili and company have raised a boatload of venture. I mean, it's just ama amazing. They've got, you know, I think over an $800 million valuation now working toward IPO. Well, you saw the Extreme I.O. acquisition. EMC bought what Extreme I.O. What do you think about You called that 400. So just for the folks out there, Dave Vellante actually called the investment with no inside information. He pegged it at 400. Yeah, I did. I pegged why, it at 400. 400? Well, because, uh, you know, it just didn't look like it. it came in at 430. So. Yeah, so it, I was just, you know, evaluating the companies that are out there and using, you know, my sources and just, you know, trying to put together my, my little mental model of the marketplace. And you see companies like... Well, yes, look at, you know, the very successful IPO of Fusion IO. Look at Violent Memories, you know, Violent Memory, over 800 million, and they're in the marketplace. You got guys like Solid Fire. I would peg them, you know, there or north Is of HP there. Is HP going to buy one? I think, I think HP, Dell, IBM, they've got to make moves. To me, it's, it's, I always use the analogy of when somebody pick, chooses a left tackle, you know, the blind side in an NFL draft, all these other teams, you know, there's a run on them. And I think, you know, this move by EMC, first of all, says a lot about EMC. It says to me that EMC recognizes that you can't take legacy storage controllers and jam Flash in them and change the world. But Flash is going to change the world. So this is an architectural statement, you know, first of all. I think they recognize that. that it's really about the I mean, entire there are customers stack. out there that are very unhappy with EMC. So I think from a product standpoint, VMAX and just the, the speed issues, they're not... They don't have the performance. They have huge legacy, big iron disk. Well, they I mean, look, I mean, EMC changed. I mean, they changed the mainframe world, right? Twenty years ago. Would you agree with that? No, statement? So Twenty years ago, EMC changed the mainframe world. Now, they basically got the, you know, same sort of. Now they've made a lot of changes to the to the system, but it's the same monolithic approach to storage. That's changing, as we've written about on Wikibon, and David Floyer has written about, and VF Cash was an announcement that you know began to attack that problem but i think emc recognized it needed to accelerate that and it fell behind we had pat gelsinger on the queue basically saying last year at emc world we fell behind fell behind fusion io remember that yeah so now emc's catching up that's how emc does they buy companies you know and that's how they how they get you know faster time to market so i think again it's a statement that the architecture is changing so to your point I think others are going to have to make a move. You know, you've got Solid Fire out there, you've got Pure. There's a, a number of these companies, uh, and I think, I think uh, that Violin Memory is essentially not in play because it's going to do an IPO unless somebody's willing to plunk, plunk down over a billion dollars for the company. But do so, you think that what I just said is accurate? That EMC has a lot of the big discs in, in like the Vmax, and they need to get increased yeah, performance. Mean, and, and, and customers sitting there going, "I got to get more out of these big." Yeah. So, but I mean, discs. here's what's happening with EMC customers. I mean, for years they've been putting data on. You know, high performance, high performance disc. Now, there's, that's an oxymoron. There's no such thing as a high performance spinning disc. But you know, higher performance meaning, you know, 15,000 RPM. What they do is they what's called short stroke it. So they only use a little bitty piece of the of the disc. They underutilize it so they can you know not have to have as much mechanical movement. Well, that's just wasting capacity. It doesn't work. You know, that's a failed model. And it just doesn't have any more legs. The answer, flash. But you can't just take that flash and jam it into an existing controller architecture. EMC knows that. And so it's now starting to get much more aggressive. So $400 million, is it expensive? Yeah, but you know, EMC has proven that it knows how to make good acquisitions. And this company, Extreme IO, really was an R&D company. I mean, out of Israel, um, really no you know, sales channel presence, uh, unlike some of the others like you know, Violin and... And, and Pure, who are building out channel presence, and presumably we'll see Solid Fire, you know, with the cloud service providers. So, I think that um, you know very clearly, John, it's recognition that something's got to change. And so, Dell, HP, IBM, maybe Oracle, even I think, all got to make some moves. NetApp, make some moves in this space, or they're going to be left behind. So, um, what's trending right now in our vertical right now is obviously mobile applications, um, big data. 
and the vertical for our sites. Um, cloud computing, big data, SAP, because we're at the event. SQL, open source, mobile application, SaaS, and RDL, whatever RDL. I've got to check that out. Hold on. Um, but let's talk about SaaS and, and these business models. Um, I was just talking with Comscore, um, a big data jock at Comscore, and he said something profound to me that I want to share to you, with you and the folks is, is that is, is that if you don't get into the kernel and code there, then it's just a SaaS application and the performance isn't strong enough. So the movement is towards less SaaS, more programming in the kernel of the data sets. Well, so how do you react um, to that? So I know, uh, for example, Ellison's been very, very critical of Workday, a company we were just talking about earlier, for doing its own database and doing its own integration. And but I think that speaks to exactly what you're saying. You know, the challenge with SaaS is, you know, it's SaaS and it's going to be, you know, it's not going to perform as well as a as a as an internal private cloud. And so that's that's the challenge that the the vendor community has been working on. And I mean, I think it's the model, right? I mean, they've been sorting out how to deal with latency issues and flash fits in there and you know other programming architectures and so um, I think that unquestionably that's a trend that you know we're going to be seeing more so of. other news in our vertical is that cloud um, in cloud vertical is that Google prices its cloud SQL offering solidifies the cloud database market this was on read write web um, they're reporting that what do you think about Google uh, in the enterprise I see Google has struggled in the enterprise. They've been much more of a focus on some core things within the enterprise, but really hasn't really nailed it. Um, uh, Cloud SQL is basically a MySQL. Um, yeah, based. I mean, and App Engine. So I, it's using App Engine. I was, per, you know, personally very disappointed to see David Girard leave because he was sort of the evangelist for you know Google Enterprise. You know, we're a Google or Gmail shop. Um, you know, we kind of bet on Gmail. You know, we're not locked in, obviously, but you know, it's kind of not done what we thought it would do. I mean, Microsoft has pretty much held on there. So, I mean, let's face it, Google is still largely a search engine company. You know, but, I mean, this is, a move, this, is a, this is a move by Google to go compete against Amazon. Amazon has DB instances that are more powerful, right? So, yeah, and well, there's a developer market. So, it's not so much enterprise, it's really Google saying, hey, we want to compete. G Drive's now out there. That should really put a nail in Bob's oh. coffin and Bob's drop, drop Bob. But my point is that Google really has not shown you know, that it can diversify. You know, it's bought a lot of companies, but its core business, its its search advertising is still really where the bread and butter is. And, you know, it's hard to find a success outside of that. So, you know, I, do I do I like the competition to Amazon? Yes. Does it make sense because they got to go after the development community? Yes. Am I skeptical? Yes. So the other article on Forbes that I'm pulling up here says, the government, the White House in particular, is spending big money on big data. Um, obviously, in Palo Alto, all the downtown space is being taken up by, by a big data company that's working on the government stuff. Um, it's an election year. Um, I was on campus when, when Obama was in town, and although he was in a different part of Stanford, I was at another private event where their chief data scientist was in town, quote, having a, a meetup. Basically, it was a recruiting session, and basically top dogs from LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Google were all there, Democrats, of course. Essentially, looking, they're looking for volunteers. Leave of absence, jump in using big data. So well, I hope, you know, obviously, big data can help swing the elections. Well, it's, it's, there's no doubt there's, a, there's, a, there's an election factor, and I'm hoping that, you know, the Department of Homeland Security is all over big data. I'm sure, I'm sure it is uh, because I think there's a lot to learn in that, in that data corpus. And so <laughs> I would hope that the government is one of the most sophisticated. I know, for instance, um, you know, we followed a, a company called CleverSafe extensively doing some in innovative stuff, and the government is, you know, one of so the biggest channels. So. This is an interesting article on Forbes. So it's a, it's a, um, it's an oxymoron program. It's a new program that's spending money to reduce money. So <laughs> it's, they're spending money on a new a new cost cutting initiative, so it's a they're spending more money for a cost cutting initiative. It's called the Big Data Research and Development Initiative. It's a program focused on improving the government's ability to to extract knowledge and insight from large complex data sets to help reduce the overall cost to deliver services. And um, I support this, and I'll tell you why. Um, I was talking to some big data folks at Strata. We were on the cube, and that woman who was on talking about healthcare for people um, in poverty-stricken environments and within outside Chicago. And they use big data to look at poverty levels 
where people were on borderline poverty and some in poverty, and they adjusted the, the execution of federal programs, not just federal programs, but staff and resource in those areas. And in this test, by using the big data, they were absolutely able to coordinate the services of delivery of services and the personnel behind it. And what does that mean? It's like Walmart. They have, they're basically instrument in the marketplace. This is an amazing opportunity, one I totally get behind. And it will not only cut costs for the government, make the government more successful. This is the promise of big data on the commercial side, Dave. And I support this all the way. Um, you know, I'm not a huge Obama fan, but this one is absolutely a great program. So there's another story that, um, that we're tracking here, which is uh, uh, that came up on the dashboard, which is Oracle's changing its tune on cloud, the cloud consumption model. It wasn't just but a year ago that you know Ellison was ranting about you know vaporware, and and, and at the time um, uh, other executives of Oracle were sort of poo-pooing the cloud. And now, remember at Oracle Open World last year, we saw the Oracle Public Cloud, um, and we saw a good tongue-in-cheek by Ellison. So, you know, clearly Oracle's long-term strategy is to, uh, you know, embrace now the cloud and uh, sort of falling into line with the rest of the industry. So that's another sort of interesting story. Now, the other thing, John, is I wanted to talk a little bit about um, your trip back east last yeah. week. Yeah, I was in Boston you know. for a, a day and a half, or uh, one full day and yeah. a di two dinners. Um, yeah, it's great. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot happening there. I mean, it's not... Silicon Valley, but there's a lot of cool stuff no, going on. No, Boston is definitely happening. Boston is a ripe environment for talent. Um, Talk about that a little bit. What, what do you mean? Well, Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley definitely has great talent, and but I, I, as I said on Twitter, it's overfished a little bit. But skills, the skill sets are there, but the talent's not, and the talent's very mobile, and there's huge demand. So first of all, if you want to make as much money as you possibly can, go to Silicon Valley if you can afford to. Uh, because the job market there is so hot between all the big data companies, um, it's just it's out of control. However, most people have families, don't want to move. Boston is one of those markets where there's a lot of systems programmers, systems guys from my age in the 40s who have computer science degrees in, in, in programming at a root level and understand operating systems. And um, then you have the new guys coming out of MIT and these schools where amazing computer science programs. So like really good computer science programs. And the kids are young, they have no baggage, they have a clean sheet of paper. They have. They don't have to think about legacy things like database, concurrency, oh, concurrency and parallelism, no problem. I can figure that out. Like yeah, well, so. They, they're, they're unconsciously competent and got some serious uh, yeah, mojo. Yeah, and, it's, it's, and Cambridge is the hotbed. So we met, I think, with, I don't know, four, five, six companies uh, last week, and we spent the day in Cambridge, and uh, you know, let's talk about them a little bit, if that's okay. We've got sure. time. So we met with uh, Mortar Data. They're very well, Mark, want to do a break? Hold on, Mark, you want to do a break? Now, let's do a quick break, and we'll be right back. We'll come back. We're going to come back, and we're going to talk about the Boston uh, companies, we, and the Boston market versus Silicon Valley, and we'll be right back with more breaking. We've got a lot of companies to talk about. We'll be right back.